Well, good morning, Grace Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on the last day of the year. I'm excited to be here. And uh, Pastor Roger, that's a little dangerous thing to let somebody come up here and preach. He didn't know what I was going to talk about today. So, but I'm excited. Um, and it's good to see uh, some friends and neighbors, too. Thank you, Steve and Tammy, my neighbors from Verona, for coming down. And I see a few other familiar faces in the crowd, too, besides our typical people here. So it's good to be here. Um, 25 years ago today, I made two New Year's resolutions. On December 31st, 1992, I made two New Year's resolutions for the year 1993. One of those resolutions was to read my Bible every day. This is actually the Bible that I had then, and it's the only Bible I've ever owned. One was to read the Bible every day, and then this, and to also read it all the way through. The other was to run the New York City Marathon. Now, which do you think was easier? Which, which do you think I kept? Which, which resolution do you think I kept? I'll tell you shortly. This time of year, we, we put the past year behind us and we focus on the new year. And everything, everything is going to be different and better, right? We're going to eat less exercise more, going to make more money, work on our relationships, stop doing all those bad habits. Those are all good things, right? And most people make resolutions. I don't know what percentage of people, actually just a show of hands, how many of you here do make New Year's resolutions? Okay, probably about half. Um, I, I do know this, of the people that make New Year's resolutions, according to both Fox News and the Huffington Post, 8% actually follow through and keep those resolutions, 8% only. And the most common New Year's resolutions, according to Nielsen, a reputable source, what would you guess is the number one resolution? Lose weight, yep. So actually, that's number two. So number one, 37% of people want to stay fit and healthy. That's a general thing. 32% of people want to lose weight. And some of these overlap because people have more than one. But 28% of people want to enjoy life to the fullest. It's kind of a vague and you know, abstract uh, resolution, but that's, those are the resolutions. Does God really care about our earthly resolutions? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Is exercising more or eating right going to have eternal consequences? Probably not. Enjoy life to the fullest? That's kind of vague. I'm not, I'm not saying don't do those, but this year, let me offer you a different take on New Year's resolutions. I'm going to let you in on what Paul has to say about making permanent change in our lives and about a shift in eternal perspective. This message today is called, now you're finding out for the first time, Roger, um, this is called Paul's Unofficial Guide to New Year's Resolutions. And for some of you, this may be the first time that you've heard this or looked at these scripture verses in this, in this way. Are you getting a little static here? Um, this message actually, as Roger said, it came to me a few weeks ago. I was actually on a business conference in Lake Geneva by myself. And I woke up at 4 a.m. one morning with a start. And like any good writer, I keep a pen and a notebook by my bed. And I woke up at 4 a.m. and this all came to me. It really did. It came to me through the, through in my sleep, but it came to me through the Holy Spirit, I believe. And I quickly got up and for the next couple hours I wrote. And I wrote a bunch of pages, actually 25 pages here. I'm going to talk fast. And I wrote fast and I'm going to talk fast today. But I wrote out 25 pages uh, that just came to me all at once. It just, it just flowed. And so that's when I called Roger and I told him that I wanted to share this. So before we go any further, though, let, let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you for this opportunity on the last day of the year to share a message with my Grace Church family. I pray, Lord, that this message would, would resonate with people. I pray that people would have ears to hear. I pray that you would give me the words to convey the message you want to convey. I pray that it would sink in. And I pray that it would... People would not just hear it today, 
but take it with them and carry it with them throughout the new year. In Jesus' name. So today I want to talk about a better way to do resolutions, what I feel is a better way to do resolutions, the eternal way. I want to share with you a a mud story and a marathon story that tie in with Paul's plan. And I want to show you who's going to help you in this quest to make these eternal resolutions. So who is this for? This message, first of all, is aimed at believers. If you are a Christian and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is for you. If you are a Christian but you haven't yet arrived, you still have minor or major sin in your life, this message is for you. And that includes me, by the way. I have, and probably most likely everyone here, I'm speaking to myself today too. I have not arrived by no means. This message is for people who make New Year's resolutions and keep them. It's for people who make New Year's resolutions and don't keep them. It's for people who don't make resolutions because they don't work for whatever reason. And if you're looking to make New Year's resolutions, whether they've worked for you in the past or not, but you want to hear a different way of doing it, this message is for you. And if you're not in any of those categories, if you're here out of curiosity, take notes. Listen, it'll come in handy somewhere down the road, and afterward I would love to talk to you, and I'm sure any of our pastors would too. Resolutions. So why do, why do we make resolutions? And why don't we keep them? Well, like the Christians in Rome and Corinth and Philippi, we get complacent, and Paul recognized this. We resolve to do something, and then we don't do it. We go back to our old ways. Whether it's, it's New Year's resolutions or sin as a Christian, we go back to our old ways. It may be little things, small sins, but we keep going back to it, right? So why is that? Are we inherently lazy? Maybe. As Christians, I believe we get lazy and complacent for one main reason. Because we're in. We're in, right? That's the goal, isn't it? To get into heaven. We've got our golden ticket punched. If we've confessed with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and we trust in him as our Savior and we've confessed our sins and repented, we're in, right? That's the goal. What else is there? Well, let me tell you, that's the starting line. I think a lot of us look at that as, and and I've often looked at this as the finish line. Hey, I'm in. That's all there is. That's the starting line. It's the starting line to the race that God has called us to run. And there are prizes. We're going to look at some scripture today. And there's a lot of analogies with running and races. Do we have any runners out there? I'm not a runner anymore, but I used to be. Any runners? Paul, for, and I'll explain this, but he has a lot of analogies. But there are prizes. There's a reward that we'll get when we come face-to-face with Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be glorious. Can you imagine on that day when we meet Jesus and he says, just like in the parable of the talents, well done, good and faithful servant. That isn't going to happen. That isn't going to happen automatically. I think sometimes there's this perception that if we're in, hey, that's that's the thing. Jesus is going to say that, right? It's not going to happen automatically. It's not going to happen for every believer. If we're standing before Jesus, if we're at the judgment seat of Christ, we're in. This isn't a matter of heaven and hell. These are are all believers at this judgment, and they're all in. They're all in. But they may not hear those words, which means they may not be reigning with Christ. Look at this. In 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 12, no, chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. I don't know if we have some of these up. Yep, okay. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. 
It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. Listen to this. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved. Listen to that. If, he, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Do we want to escape through the flames just barely? I don't think so. We're in, but there's not necessarily a reward. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Next verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. By the way, these these running references, these race references, Paul was speaking to the people of Corinth. And just outside of Corinth in those days, there was something called the Isthmian Games. It's kind of like the Olympic Games, but they were every two years. So when he was speaking in these terms of races and running, he wasn't speaking to runners. He wasn't at a, you know, these weren't Olympians. These weren't, these weren't athletes. But they all understood what he was saying. They, they, they got the analogies. So before, before we set out to race... Before you, if you, if, you, if you sign up for a race, if you sign up to do something, what do you need to do? You kind of need to get in shape first, right? We need to get in shape. So the first step we need to do is to stop sinning. Before we set out on the race doing the good stuff that Jesus has called us to do, to run the race, and each of us has our own race, by the way. It's not like we're competing with others. We've got to bump somebody off. We're each running our own race, Okay. Although there's a fun verse that I'll share with you in a minute about bumping somebody off. Um, I think Paul had a sense of humor here, too, just like God does. So, Romans 6. That's why Paul wrote this chapter. In just a second, actually, Mike, if you would pass out those, those verses. I think I still have mine here from a few years ago. That's why Paul wrote this. Because Christians... Mike's going to hand these out. I'd like everybody to have one of these, and I think they're laminated. This is mine from three years ago. Christians kept going back to their old ways. And I've been there. I've been there. Anger, envy, lust, whatever it might be. We keep going back to the old things, don't we? Paul knew this, and he wrote an entire chapter of Romans to address the fact that people kept going back to their old ways. I've, I've read the Bible all the way through. I've read Romans many times. Spoiler alert, though, uh, of those two resolutions, the one that I did make was the New York Marathon. The one that I did not make that year that, that I didn't follow through on was reading my Bible every day and all the way through. But Since then, I've read it many times, and I've read the book of Romans many times, but for whatever reason, it never sunk in. I've even taken classes on the book of Romans. I've read Romans 6, never really sank in, until three years ago. It was, I think, probably this time of year, three years ago, end of 2014, going into 2015, Pastor Roger handed out these cards. This is the one that I had, and... My resolution for 2015 was to memorize Romans 6. Now, for those of you in the audience that are kids, how many kids have been in Awana here? Memorize verses? Okay. I, when I was a kid, I didn't, we didn't have Awana. I didn't memorize verses. I didn't know any of this stuff. None of it. So I didn't start even memorizing verses till I was in my med, mid-20s. I've probably memorized 50 or 100 verses, but... My goal that year was to memorize Romans 6. And so what I would do every day, I didn't have a car at the time, which is not a problem because I work from home, I'm a writer, didn't really need a car, but every day I would walk from my house in Verona downtown to the Sousier coffee shop. It's about a mile and a half. It would take me about 25 minutes. And this was in January, so I had my winter coat on and my my hat and my gloves and my boots and stuff, and I would walk 25 minutes to the Sousier every day. And 
and I, I walked with my head down looking at my card. I had my card out. People probably th- wondered what I was doing. But over that course of about a month in January, I, I memorized these verses. And to this day, it's, it's actually stayed with me. But let me just read a few parts of this real quick to you, be, just to show you the kind of language. I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. But Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It goes on and on like that for 23 verses. And it's actually kind of hard to memorize because you think, wait, did, did, did I just say that? Is Paul repeating himself? Yeah, he is. He's repeating himself. Paul is hitting this thing from every angle. He's, he's hammering us up and down, left and right, from all around. He's hammering us with this message. Stop doing this stuff. Stop sinning. I implore you, stop doing this. 23 verses. He just keeps hitting it over and over and over. So it's actually kind of hard to memorize because there, are, there is a lot of repetition. You'd think that would be easy to memorize, but he says it in slightly different ways. It's not going to be good, I'm telling you. Yeah, you can get away with it. And yeah, this is Paul, the way I'm picturing Paul saying this. He's like, yeah, 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 I know you've got your golden ticket punched already to get into heaven, but guess what? Just because you're in doesn't mean it's going to be all hanging out at Jesus' pad, eating at the royal banquet every night, swapping stories, having fun. You, my friend, might be assigned something a little bit lower on the totem pole. And you might not be dining with Jesus at the royal table. I'm not kidding around here. Are you in? Yeah. Grace? Sure. Eternal fun and highest reward for sinning over and over? I don't think so, dude. By the way, that's me paraphrasing Paul all the way through, in case you didn't get it. Um... Someday I think I'm going to write a version like the Message Bible, but it'll be all the whole thing will be like that. It'll be kind of fun. Let's uh, look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. And, and, and if we had time, we don't, because I want to finish at 11 today, but if we had time, I could go on and on. And actually, I've probably got two or three sermons here. So we've got future stuff to talk about. But... He's got so many points that, that, that solidify this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Are we in? Yes. How we spend our days in the kingdom with Jesus? That all depends. So we need to stop sinning. There are kingdom consequences here. But what about here on earth? Surely God forgives our transgressions, our peccadilloes. I mean, come on. We're saved, right? We're in, like Flynn. Yeah? But, again, is this, is this how you want to get in? Legally, for sure, you're in. Were you an upright, model Christian? Again, I'm speaking to myself here, too. This is just a reminder to myself, too, to, keep, to, to stay the course. Did you come in clean or did you come in muddied up and by the skin of your teeth? This isn't an in or out thing. It's not a heaven or hell issue. You're in and you're going to come face to face with Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. He might be really proud of the way we ran the race or a little disappointed. It reminds me back in high school, I ran cross country and every year we had this cross-country meet at a high school, New Berlin Eisenhower. Anybody ever run a cross-country meet there by chance? (laughs) So at New Berlin Eisenhower, on this course, it's a 5K race, like all cross-country races for high school. And about halfway through the race, there's a little creek that runs through the course. This This is a lot of fun. And it was only about two foot wide, very easy to jump over. We could have all easily jumped over it. But Going down to this creek was a downhill slope like this. Then you've got the, about a two-foot creek. 
and then an uphill slope on the other side, grass on both sides. Well, you can imagine that in October in Wisconsin, this, with all the rain and stuff, this would get kind of muddy. And we could have all easily jumped over this creek. But what do you think we decided to do? <laughs> we, we, we all went right through the mud and right down the muddy middle where everybody was going. So you could make it down, but then you, th- there was the mud. And then to get up the other side, that grass got slippery and people were falling. And, and you've seen those mud races. Well, this was long before the days of mud races. This was literally a mud race. And so we, we, just, we just all took it as a badge of honor to go through the mud. We could have easily gone, gone to the edges and gone up the clean side and finished the race leaner and cleaner and faster, but we chose to go through, and I did too. I chose to go through the mud because it was a lot more fun. So, again, it was just one big sloppy mess, but, you know, it's kind of like sinning. We choose to go through the mud We choose to follow what everybody else is doing, don't we? We go through the muddy middle instead of going to the clean, narrow edges. It's easier to follow along, easier to do what everybody else is doing. What's the difference, right? We're in. Or we could choose, like I said, to take the narrow path, the one most people choose, the one most people don't choose, I should say. As runners, we could have done that. We could have gone up the sides. The interesting thing, I have to show you this. These are, th- these are actually my actual shoes that I wore in high school 35 years ago in those mud races and in many other races. They're not spotless, but they're pretty clean, aren't they? Reminds me of Isaiah 118. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. We're wiped clean. Even though we've been through the mud, we can be wiped clean. We're forgiven. We have grace. But shall we keep on sinning, Paul says? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? What's the answer to that? Three words? By no means. And because someday we're going to be face to face with Jesus... And if you don't hear, well done, good and faithful servant from Jesus, guess who you're going to see next? Who are you going to see next? Not Satan. This is heaven, remember? You're in. Now this this next part, you guys, this 95% of my message today is scriptural. This next 5% I made up. This is not at all scriptural. This is just what I picture, okay? So, here's what I'm picturing. You can put that picture up if you would, if you can find it. (laughs) By the way, my daughter, Safina, is the artist. She drew these pictures, so I'll explain this picture here. So, I picture Paul. He's off to the sidelines. He's waiting to console you. You've just had your little one-on-one session with Jesus, and it didn't quite go like you wanted it to. So, you think Paul's off to the side, ready to console you. You've just disappointed Jesus a little bit gotten a little shunned off, no royal banquet on the first night for you, being in the kingdom. In fact, you just got assigned to the barracks with a bunch of other muddy runners down to some cabins. They're all stinky and muddy. That's where you're going to be spending a little while instead of reigning with Christ. But you're in. So you walk over to Paul, and he's, he's sitting in the back row of the theater, he just watched what played out on the, on the, up front on stage with you and Jesus. And you think he's going to comfort you and say, it's okay. Yeah, Jesus will come around, you know. Maybe in a hundred years or so you'll, you'll hear that well done stuff. But no, Paul isn't who you think he is either. Paul takes a rolled up newspaper and he whacks you on the head. And he says, what were you thinking? Did you think I was just messing around and kidding around with that Romans 6 stuff? Dude, that took me a long time to write that. I mean, could I have come up with any more ways to say, stop sinning? Remember, first I said, what was it here? First I said, what shall I say then? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Then I jump ahead to chapter verse 15. Then I said, 
again. I should know this. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sitting so that grace may increase? By no means. I said it twice. I repeated myself. No means no. So Paul's not real happy with you either. That should be enough. Just picture Paul whacking you upside the head with a news, rolled up newspaper. So this is this sin no more stuff? Is this easy? Of course not. It's not easy. Is it worthwhile? Most definitely. Why? Because beyond getting in, beside the fact that we have our golden ticket punched, there's a reward. So number one, we need to stop sinning. That's step one. There's really three stages here. The first stage is to stop sinning, and we need to keep coming back to Romans 6. Stop sinning. The second stage is to acknowledge that we have a race to run. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, Paul writes to the to the people of Philippi, the church of Philippi. And he says, Brothers, I have not yet taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize to which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul himself says, I have not yet taken hold of it. He's writing this to himself. So even Paul didn't have this down. We still slip up, we get hindered, we mess up, we get muddy. We need to keep going back to Romans 6. We need to keep coming back to Romans 6. Endure. There's three words here that come to mind. Endure, persevere, overcome. It's actually one of my favorite words in the entire Bible, overcome. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. By the way, quick aside, I don't think we finish, I don't think we get to the end of the book enough. We read the Gospels, we read the Old Testament, we read the Gospels, we read the book of Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. I don't think enough of us get to the end of the book. I would encourage you, besides memorizing Romans 6 this year, I would encourage you to get deep into Revelation. It's like back in school. History. We had history in grade school, middle school, high school. We always started with the Revolutionary War, then we got to the Civil War, then we got to World War One and World War Two. And I don't know if it was the teachers purposefully taking their time or they didn't know anything about the Vietnam War and the Korean War, but I didn't learn anything in all my years of school about the Korean War or the Vietnam War because we never got to the back of the, the lessons. I think it's kind of like that with the Bible. Sometimes we don't get to the back of the book enough. Revelation 3.21, Jesus says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Just it, it, Are these images giving you pictures that you maybe haven't thought of a lot? As I was preparing this and as I wrote this that one morning in Lake Geneva, it just it, it just started reinforcing to me just the gloriousness of it. I think sometimes we have this vague, abstract notion of heaven and just like, yeah, we're going to be in. There's there's very specific things that that Paul talks about, that John talk about, talks about, that Jesus himself talks about, about what the kingdom is going to be like. And if you read, and this is a message for another day and another time, and it's very involved, but if you read about the millennial kingdom and the thousand-year reign of Christ, it is, it is a glorious thing. And we're going to have bodies. and We're going to be living in the kingdom of Jerusalem. In fact, I call this, we'll have a picture coming up here, that this is the Jerusalem Marathon. We're on the race to Jerusalem. I'll explain. Do we have hindrances? Yes. Do we have hindrances or just, a hindrance is like a weight. Anything that weighs people down, like, that weighs runners down, like the mud and the the wetness would weigh a runner down. We have hindrances. We have distractions. We have mud. We have hills. We have activities that pull us away. We have sin, of course. That's different for each of us. Could be the tongue. God's warriors last semester we were talking. We went through the book of James. It could be the tongue. It could be lust. It could be lying. It could be envy. Whatever your personal sin is, you know what that is. 
Could it be other people? Yeah, be careful about who you hang out with. Parents, we all we always talk to our kids about, you know, we want our kids, we want to be careful about who our kids are hanging out with, right? Are we careful about who we're hanging out with? Are we hanging out more with people who have earthly desires and earthly resolutions and earthly pursuits? Are we hanging out with believers? Not that you shouldn't hang out with non-believers, but be careful of how you spend your time. This is not one of the verses I have up here, but in uh, another race analogy, Paul, in the letter to the Galatians, in chapter 5, verse 7, he says, you were running a good race, who cut in on you? (laughs) I don't know exactly what he means by that. I didn't study that verse. But he says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you? In other words, who bumped you off? Who, Who pulled you off track? Don't let people pull you off track. I thought that one was kind of funny. So how do we do this? How do we overcome this tendency to keep falling back, to keep falling short? Realize that we have help. I think we have a verse from Hebrews. I know they have it somewhere. Hebrews, there it is. Chapter 12, verse 1. And actually, my friend Steve remembers this. Steve and I did a race a few years back at High Point Church called the Elijah Run. And this verse was on the back of the T-shirts. And uh, and Steve and I were the leaders of the pack of that race, if I remember correctly. But um, but it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I'm going to break that down. There's four parts to that. I'm going to break down in just a second. But real quick story. To go back to my the beginning, my New York my New Year's resolutions 25 years ago. So the New York Marathon, that was one of my goals that year, one of my resolutions, and there's a tie-in to this. So this was back in, before, before being able to commit to it, I had to actually get in. So unlike heaven, which is obviously a free gift, a free gift to anybody that wants to get in, it's not a lottery, we can all get in. The New York City Marathon is not a free gift, it's not a, um, no, not everybody can get in, there's a limit. And that year, actually, um, there was a lot of interest in it because I don't know if you remember, Oprah Winfrey ran the New York Marathon that year. So I actually got—I get to tell people that I ran with Oprah Winfrey and I beat her, but um, which is kind of fun. I did, uh, but I don't even know how we did this. This was back in the days before the internet, so I, I think I actually had to send in a like a paper application in February of that year, and then a few weeks later I got my letter back saying you're in, you're in. So what what did I proceed to do? Like Christians who once were in were like, hey, we're in, you know, I'm good to go. I proceeded not to do anything. I proceeded not to train. I proceeded not to run. And I thought, well, I got plenty of time, plenty of time. Just like we maybe think, well, I got plenty of time. I'm 50 years old. I've, you know, got a long life to live here, you know. And the race is the first Sunday in November. Spring came. I was busy with a new job. I moved back to Madison. Um, summer came. I got caught up in things. Didn't run, didn't run, didn't train. August came, still hadn't started running. September came, too. Now, if you know anything about marathon training, you're supposed to train for about three months, and you're supposed to do a bunch of long runs and work up to 20 miles and all this stuff. I had done a couple before, so I knew what to what to do, but I just thought, eh, I'm in. I'm good to go. And I, I proceeded over about a month, month and a half, to maybe do about four decent training runs. That's it for a 26.2 mile marathon. You can imagine how much of a hurting unit I was on race day that year. So me and my two friends, Sue and Rob, that did this with me, they were soccer players and they were soccer coaches and they were in really good shape from that. So they did okay, but I was really hurting. So we ran through the five boroughs of New York, but you get to the end and what carried me through and I had hit the wall. You know what that is. You hit the wall and your glycogen sources are just depleted got to Central Park. The last five or six miles of the New York City Marathon are in Central Park. And I think it was because of Oprah Winfrey running that year that there were so many crowds, but I'm not exaggerating. For five or six miles, wall-to-wall people, shoulder to shoulder, about eight people deep, cheering you on. And that's what got me through that marathon. And I, it makes me think of this verse in Hebrews 
where he says, therefore we, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now he's talking about, Paul just got done talking in chapter 11 of Hebrews of the Old Testament saints. He's talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and Samuel and all these people. That's what he's talking about. I like to think it's maybe angelic hosts too, but I like to think that we have a cheering section in heaven cheering us on through this race, right? Something to think about. So this is the the Jerusalem Marathon. You can put that picture up. So I like to think of this as the Jerusalem Marathon. We've got a crowd of witnesses cheering us on. And real quick, so these these are this is our cheering section. So we have people to help us. And I picture Jesus at the finish line holding up a sign that says, Go, Steve, you can do it. There's that sign up there that says, uh, Don't let him cut in on you. <laughs> That's scriptural, Galatians 5, verse 7. But we're, we're not there yet. We've got to finish this race. We've got to overcome. So we need to throw off everything that hinders us. What hinders us? Anything that keeps us from carrying out our calling, something non-essential to our mission. Anything that pulls us away. For everybody that's different. For some people, that could be time on Facebook. If you do it to connect with other if you do it to connect with non-believers or to fellowship with other believers and you know lift each other up, that's great. For other Christians, Facebook time might be a waste of time that could be spent doing other things. We could say the same about anything. I'm not saying don't have fun pursuits, you know, don't have hobbies and stuff like that, but think about is this a hindrance? Is this a hindrance to my true calling to my race? Sin. Of course, that's a little heavier. The sin that so easily entangles. Again, that's something in particular for each of us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We need to run lean and clean and determined with perseverance. We can't get complacent. So again, I picture this race. We're running kind of like a marathon, kind of like my New York City Marathon experience. We're in the race. We're in heaven. But we have to run it and complete it. This year... Let's stop aiming for earthly achievement and personal gain. Sure, lose weight, stop smoking, eat healthier, exercise, all that stuff. It's all good. But let me encourage you to set the bar a little higher. Aim for kingdom rewards, eternal rewards. And by the way, again, this is, I I could have a whole bunch more material on this about the crowns of righteousness and the rewards and get into specifics on that. We'll talk about that sometime maybe. But first and foremost, shall we go on sinning? No. By no means. We need to throw off every... Second of all, throw off everything that hinders. What hinders you? Junk TV shows, R-rated movies, too much internet fluff time, whatever. I got hooked on Netflix for a while. It was on my iPad. had the app on my iPad. I was watching just dumb shows. I'm like, ah, I told me to get rid of this. I, I just, and now I don't, I don't even know how our TV functions. We still have it, but I don't even know how our TV works, so I can't even use it anymore. But I had to get rid of Netflix. It was, it was a hindrance. Hanging out with too much with people who have earthly resolutions and no concept of kingdom ones, go further. Get rid of the sin that so easily entangles. Persevere. Finish. Let's go beyond, I'm in. I'm saved. Now what? Now Start running your race. Take up kingdom running. I'm not a runner anymore, but I like I, I love these analogies. I love the idea of kingdom running. Run the Jerusalem Marathon. This is the race to run. You should see, by the way, you should see the finishers' medals for this Jerusalem Marathon. They're really cool. <laughs> Can you imagine too at the end of the Jerusalem Marathon a selfie? That would make a good Facebook post, wouldn't it? So run the race to win. A couple last verses I want to leave you with. Second John, verse 8. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. In other words, stay the course. And then Revelation 22, verses 12 and 13. This is, you guys, this is 10 verses from the end of the Bible. Again, I really encourage you to get into the last book of the Bible. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am coming soon. I truly believe that. I I believe that we are in end times. I don't know if that's 100 years from now or 50 years from now or 10 years from now or 10 days from now, but we are in end times. So many things point to it. And I'm not talking about just natural things, which are indicative of it, but biblical things. Look at, look at, look at the Bible. Look, read the book of Revelation. Read the book of Daniel. It's in there. One last thing. Most of this, again, came to me in my sleep. And it's amazing what goes through your head and through your mind and in your heart when you soak in the Word, especially right before you go to bed and upon waking, and then all through the day too. But it's amazing what comes to you in your dreams and in your sleep when you're soaking in this. My one big final piece of advice to get rolling on all of this. You have your cards, your Romans 6 cards. My one big last final piece of advice, memorize this, internalize it, live it. So Paul is saying to us, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Say it with me. What's the answer? By no means. Paul would be proud. Jesus will be too.